nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Uh, I want to welcome folks to today's uh, session uh, of our nanotech, Nano Educators Topical Seminar Series. But I did want to introduce our two, two speakers. Um, actually, I see Nancy might have had some bandwidth issues, so she's not here. But I'll tell you that uh, Terry, uh, uh, Terry Kuzma is a professor here at Penn State. He's been here uh, for 1,327 years, I believe. Um, uh, he's been here a long time uh, as a former industry experience and uh, has been teaching a, our a NMT capstone course, uh, which is focused on uh, nano workforce, nano micro workforce. And Nancy Luagi um, is uh, actually from um, Normandale, uh, Minnesota, and she's at Normandale Community College, which is right near, near uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Uh, and they have a vacuum technology program uh, that uh, we've been working with those folks for quite a while. Um, so she's going to actually take um, do some do a demo in her laboratory uh, after Terry and does Steve. the. And Steve. Uh, oh yeah, oh, thank you, Steve. Steve O'Sell also. Thank you so much, Steve O'Sell. will be assisting her in that presentation. Thank you so much for reminding me. So that is all I have to share. Um, and I just wanted to do the official welcome. I want to say hi to Lily. Hi, Lily. I hope things are going well up in upstate New York. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. Terry, why don't you take over from here? Yeah, I will. Thanks, Bob. So let me get my share up here. So as Bob said, you know, I, I teach a program. Uh, I guess my primary, what I spend the most time doing at Penn State, I teach an 18 credit program on nanotechnology and it encompasses everything. But, you know, one of the foundations and I think, you know, my opinion and what people tell me from industry, the strongest foundation is a strong background in vacuum. So if I would meet with companies and have lunch with them, et cetera, or whatever, you know, sell the program, really the strongest technical point they ask me about is, do the students understand vacuum technology? And that, that's just my experience. They always ask if they show up on time, if I require attendance, if they work on group projects, and the technical thing that they ask about, those are soft skills, I guess. The technical things that they ask about is, you know, how well do you teach vacuum and vacuum hardware? So that, that's really universal to, you know, creating also, uh, you know, essential and a lot of the characterization techniques, like the scanning electron microscope, for example. So it's not only in manufacturing and manufacturing on a nanoscale, it's in characterization and really you really in some senses broadly you can't have nanofabrication unless you have really good characterization because you're going to be blindly making things that are you know thousands of times smaller than you could see so you're just hoping that it works sometimes but with the characterization tools you have the ability to actually judge what you're making on that scale and then go back and do like a controlled feedback loop thing, adjust your recipe, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really, really crucial. So again, you know, uh, you know, you might not be familiar with vacuum, uh, but I just wanted to set the stage that this isn't something that people don't care about. It's actually very, very foundational to the, the companies that, you know, I deal with. And I also teach this in graduate school at Penn State. And we get a lot of people want to know that a lot of students want to know that from other departments. So they're in biology or in chemistry or whatever, but they really want to do more like material science and work with the machines, right? And work with the systems and understand vacuum. So that's really important to like polymer sciences, you know, that, that you wouldn't really think about or chemistry kind of people. My daughter actually makes, she's at Penn state now and she's ready to graduate and her, uh, her area is to make polymers that regenerate spinal injuries, so nerve growth things. And interestingly, she has to know vacuum quite a bit and the tools that she uses, although she's more chemistry and uh, pharmaceutical. She actually has a PhD in pharmacy too, and now she's getting one in advanced materials, but that's her area. And then I go over and I help her fix machines. She's all proud of her dad because I go I go mix a vacuum leak or something for her or tell her that a pump is bad and take my stuff over there. So she's all she's all proud that dad come over and helped her across the campus and I get to walk across the campus. 
so there you go. So, you know, one of the things I, you know, before you do a presentation, you should be interested. So I, I hope that you're interested and engaged because this really, I think is foundational, you know, so, so I'm going to do on vacuum function, you know, what is vacuum, the operation of the systems kind of, and then a, a quick look at the pumps. And I take about 20 hours of contact time to go through this initially, plus we do labs and homework and reading. So this is a, you know, probably 10% of what I'd like to really do as a minimum to get the point across. So, but I'm going to try to get the, the macro things apart in 90 minutes so we can get Nancy and Steven here so they can actually show you some interesting hardware. So what I want to do first of all is so that we have a background of what I'm talking about is I wanted to talk about like gas properties and vacuum and what, what vacuum is. And most people don't know that kind of, I mean, people know, you know, in some senses, if you say a loaf of bread, they kind of have in their mind what it would weigh or, you know, how big is a milkshake? They're not going to like a five gallon bucket, you know, for a milkshake. They, they have like a, a visceral feel for those things. But vacuum, it's really not something that we talk about in a day to day to quantify it, you know. So it's lucky that the person that's not, a, you know, in, in engaged in this, this uh, area, if they know that atmospheric pressure is 760 torr, you know, so we start out with that number that, you know, we, we have this standard, this number, like kilometers or, you know, miles per hour or some other event or degrees Celsius, you know, the thing that we have to envision is what's a tour, you know, and so that we're going to try to explain that today, like what's a tour and what's vacuum. And importantly, I think the real idea here is not just what's a definition of what's a tour, but when I have vacuum level, how does that impact the product? So for example, if I was making fishing lures, I really don't need to have like super crazy expensive vacuum. I just need to have generic vacuum, not too much. And I'm going to make a pretty good fishing lure. And that fishing lure is going to get lost on your third or fourth cast. So you, it doesn't have to be perfect. Now that's a lot different than I was going to make a metallic coating on a heart valve. Because that has to be absolutely pure. And for the most part, it's semi-permanent and it's life-giving, right? So for that, we want to have purity levels and the ability to say my material is exacting. So if we were doing something like, you know, military, making a missile part or something like that, it can't like work some of the times or fail 1% of the time, just like a heart valve. Now, you know, a fishing lure, if it peels a little bit or it's not so red or gold colored, it doesn't really matter anyhow, you know, I mean, for that, for that market, for that price point. But for our expectations and for like vacuum processing and to make a Pentium chip and to make a transistor, you know, we're, we're making things that are a lot smaller than a virus, like a gate on a transistor. So transistors are like insanely small. So any contamination or the wrong oxygen in there at some time would be detrimental to that. So the area that we work in and to define nanotechnology, it's an exacting thing where we have to have purity. So one of the first things I'd like to say, I'll say it now, vacuum is clean. So how clean is good enough? You know, that's a very good question for industry because you don't want to spend $10 in manufacturing on a fishing lure that everybody has a price point at $3 because you'll go out of business and you're over engineering that, you know? So, you know, you have to look at what is my product and how would I apply systems, machines, and maybe even vacuum? So that's a greater idea. And I think that that's like the real deal. You know, what does vacuum mean? And everything's important when it's money, right? So not just money is a, you know, a, a, a maybe a farce, but we're, we can make things like biomedical devices and that stuff is really important. Does that make sense? Like my daughter, she's making, you know, polymers for spinal regeneration. That's cool. And, and I told you, I help her, uh, you know, with her vacuum systems every once in a while, she asks me questions, you know, so that that's really kind of, kind of cool. And she pumps real crazy things. 
like she and, and her oil was always bad, you know. And I'm like, what are you making these things? So she she has some uh, she has aggressive environments that she's in, at least in my mind, you know, from the semiconductor market. So again, one of the first things I'd like you to think about is vacuum equals clean. And, and, and maybe a rhetorical question is how clean is clean, you know, and how much clean do we need? And if we clean more than is necessary, then we're wasting money. And then if we don't clean enough and our product fails, then that's more than wasting money. We could cause cat you know, catastrophic event like somebody's heart valve not working or an air pack not going off. So we need to make sure that we have purity levels that meet that. And it's a legal constraint. People want to know, and like for products that are like high value products, they save how that was manufactured, like the recipes and how the machine acted. And it say if a plane, you know, crashes, they're like, we want to look at that radio and all the records you have of those components. So this is, this is actually a legal issue and certainly a moral issue to produce things that are at that level. Does everybody see? So we want to certainly be clean enough that we can assure that our product is morally stable because we don't want space shuttles to blow up. Does everybody see that? So that's what we're looking at here. So vacuum also equals safe when we look at it from the manufacturing environment because when we're in manufacturing, a lot of places you go in heavy manufacturing or manufacturing general, you walk in and it has all these crazy smells and things like that. And you get a headache or something like that. And you're like, wow, you know, that's probably not good for a person. And it probably is not. So when we, when we do materials, when we're in a vacuum environment in a vacuum chamber, and it would be something that would be, I don't know, as big as a microwave oven, you know, just to get your head around typical vacuum chambers. That would be for something that we're, you know, producing as big as a plate, you know, and a, a typical semiconductor plate. But we can also have vacuum systems that do like, my picture window here is five foot by five foot. So they have to put like UV coatings on there. So they vacuum systems that'll take big sheets of glass like at PPG Industries, you know, and they have to apply coatings to them. So vacuum's necessary there to get the quality of the coating. Does everybody see that? And it's on a nano scale. It's two dimensional, bigger le length and width, but Z thickness, really, really thin, you know? So that's what we're looking at. This environment is good because it, it keeps the, weight, the, the workers safe and it's good just for the environment. We really don't want to be releasing all these uh, crazy chemistries. If we have them in an enclosed environment, we're using the minimum that we need to do our work and then post the vacuum pumps, we can put it into scrubbers that effectively make to mitigate that stuff so that we're not causing undue pollution and environmental impact. Does everybody see that? So I, I know that most people, when they say like, you know, OSHA and EPA, it's kind of whatever, a little bit scary because they, they write out big fines, but they're good for everybody because then people aren't getting cancer and, and you know, rivers aren't polluted and things like that. So, you know, that there are harsh, you know, uh, portions of the government, but they're there for a reason to keep everybody safe. And vacuum environment helps that. So for example, we could etch with hydrofluoric acid, which is the go-to thing to do for silicon dioxide, and which is the biggest part, or probably one of the most important materials in semiconductors is silicon dioxide and silicon, but I think, I always say silicon dioxide's queen and silicon is king. And I was raised to believe the queen was more important than, than, than the king. I don't know, from my, from my cultural background, you know, in Europe. So, but anyhow, that silicon dioxide, the go-to material is it's HF. And in the liquid form, once we use it, we really have a, a penalty to pay because we have to get rid of it and it's dangerous, it costs a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. If we would just use the gas that comes off there, the evaporant, then we could do a tremendous amount more of product and probably in a controlled sense than in the wet phase. Does that make sense? So the gas phase for nanotechnology is really important. So another good question or a point of vacuum, why do we want vacuum? It's a good question. 
one of the reasons from a manufacturing aspect in nanotechnology, we want to build things like atoms or molecules at a time. And the things that we build, like a gate on a transistor or some silicon pieces, they might have a tolerance of atoms, like plus or minus 10 atoms. So how do you apply atoms in a liquid state? How do you apply atoms in a solid state? It's a lot easier to do it in a gas state in a vacuum because it's the appropriate measure cup and timeline, like the dosage over time is appropriate. So the machines that we have in, in, in nanotechnology, the rates of growth are rather small. Does that make sense? So we're, we're trying to do things really slow because we're making tiny things anyhow, but the slower and more care we do them, the easier or the, the, the more we could probably predict that we're gonna have a perfect product. Does that make sense? Maybe by analogy, if I told a carpenter build me a dog house in two hours. I'd expect that it's not perfect, but it's good enough. And I paid that guy that rate and it met the price point. But if I told a carpenter, I'm going to give you two weeks, build me a dog house for my Labrador retriever. And that would be overkill and too much to do. Does everybody see that? So vacuums like that, we want to build the appropriate thing in the appropriate time with the appropriate dosage or money to get the product that, that would be correct. Does everybody see that? So I'm trying to explain, you know, not just the physics of vacuum, but like, why is it important or what does this imply? There you go. So vacuum equals clean. And this is what I was saying that the second line I was discussing the environment, et cetera. And then these vacuum based systems, they're very common in nanotechnology and advanced materials. They're not the only game in time but they're a big chapter within the book of modern manufacturing. Does everybody see that? So they're foundational, but they don't have to be everywhere, but they make sense because for the most part, we're doing things an atom or a molecule at a time. And in a vacuum state, because we don't have that much mass of our raw material, we can assemble things moderately slowly so that it's like a puzzle piece, missing puzzle piece. The atom comes in and fills in that exact puzzle piece. So everything's like coherent and there's no defects. Does that make sense to everybody like from a material aspect? So generally we would like to do that. We wanna make, we were making really, really crazy small stuff and we can't have atoms out of place. So how are we gonna be able to build at that level? So, so what, 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 what is our paintbrush? You know, we're trying to use a real fine paintbrush and our, and our paintbrush here or one of the tools that we're going to use is vacuum technology. And that's going to allow us to deposit materials, to etch materials, which is selective removal of materials. And it's also going to allow us to look at characterization. And what we're going to look at is the thing we want to examine, not background gas or environment or smoke or dog dandruff or anything like that, because the vacuum, again, Vacuum's clean and that's what we're assuring with the machine. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you background here and then what they're gonna do, like Nancy and Steve, they're gonna show you their vacuum stuff, like their training equipment that they use there. So I'm gonna try to finish up in an hour and a half or so, and then or even shorter than that, and then try to turn it over to them and you can actually see what a system looks like. I'm gonna give you a schematic drawing so that you would have like a conceptual idea and then we can overlay that with, with, with uh, Steve and Nancy that they're actually gonna show you what a, a system would look like. So that'll add to your visualization of what we're, we're trying to do here. So what is vacuum? It's the removal of gas molecules, air, moisture, and gas residues from an enclosed container like a controlled environment. And why do we wanna do that? Well, in atmosphere, like in my kitchen, it probably smells a little bit like it was raining this morning. So it probably smells a little bit like wet dog, but not too bad. And I like my dog. Megan's really cool. But, you know, I might have dog odor in there. I might have a, a residual uh, egg odor when I fried my eggs over easy this morning. I, I might have, and then I for lunch, I had uh, smoked salmon on crackers with cream cheese. So they might be in this room along with humidity 
or I don't know, uh, deodorant, uh, hair shampoo odor, all skin, you know, that was, it's a crazy environment because there's all these wild cards and from day to day I eat different things or it's not wet outside. So, you know, this environment changes. And if I were to try to make a product in here atomically, it's like a wild card. So I have a controlled environment, a vacuum chamber, and with the vacuum pumps, I get rid of almost everything, relatively speaking. I take it to a super duper pure level. And then when I do my work, I would usually put in pure gases from a gas cylinder that have purity levels like 99.999. And then I know exactly how I'm growing materials, for example. Does that make sense? There's not going to be random like bus fumes or dog dandruff or sam smoked salmon odor in, in, in my product. Does everybody see that? So that's what we're trying to do. We remove all these wild card crazy things, but air, and air has moisture in it. And we know from, you know, just basic chemistry or whatever, it may be looking at basic chemistry, taking a few steps back or recalling homework that you did in college. It's you're always looking at things with like hydrogen switching around or oxygen and all that. These are big players like hydrogen and oxygen are like major league players in chemistry, like on a periodic table, they're movers and doers. Does everybody see that? So if I was trying to make pure silicon and I had residual water vapor, which is ubiquitous, you know, it's all over the place, right? If I had water vapor in my machine, then I'm not going to get silicon. I'm going to get silicon oxide and silicon with hydrogen in it. And that's kind of bad. And, and hydrogen itself is a little bit flighty. It's like a little hole. And it'll leave under temperature. So hydrogen's a little bit, hydrogen's like a wild card on the periodic table. It's hard to control. You know, so we're, we're really leery of, of materials that have hydrogen, in it, like silicon, because at certain temperatures or through diffusion, that hydrogen can leave. It, it's a weak bond. Does that make sense? So it's not, it always reminds me of like a highway. And here in Pennsylvania, Ohio, too, they have poor roads because where we sit uh, geographically. So there's a lot of freeze thaw. So we get potholes. But then those guys are sitting around all winter just playing cards because they have not, well, they salt the roads too much, right? But then they go out with that dry patch and they put it in the, in the potholes and it only lasts for so long and then it comes out. It's like a temporary fix. Does everybody see that? Hydrogen tends to be like that. So really this water thing kind of tends to be wicked. We don't like it at all. So luckily due to like vapor pressure, et cetera, et cetera, you know, if there's water in the chamber and water on the sidewalls, if we pump below five times uh, 10 to the minus four, it'll like peel all that water off the walls. So when we get to an area like 10 to the minus six, that's pretty clean because we got rid of most of the contamination that we're really, really, really worried about. And one of them will be water. So if you even look at the hardware, the hardware that people sell, there's like machines and systems and gaskets and fittings, and they're good to like 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seven. And for the most part, that's good enough. And it's good enough for the majority of the things in your phone, your iPhone, right? Now, if it was a, a rocket or a missile or something, then you'd probably, the specifications would be more vacuum or things like a laser or an LED. They're rather simple they would be done at deeper vacuum pressures, a lot of their processing, because they're so pure, you know, that light emission thing's kind of tricky. So we would look at that, but for the most products, we can map to the hardware and say, 10 to the minus six is really making me feel pretty good. And I would say that's the sweet spot. So in life, we have things like speed limits in our car. And if I told you I'm in a school zone at 3.30 in the afternoon and I'm going 75 miles an hour, you guys might cringe and go like, hey, you're going to jail, buddy, because 75 miles an hour in a school zone is not so swift. You have a feel for that. It's not appropriate and it wouldn't map. Same way I'm saying, hey, I'm on the interstate, Route 80 here in Pennsylvania cuts right through the middle or like the turnpike kind of stuff. And 
I'm going 25 miles an hour on the, the interstate, then that's all wrong and kind of dangerous too. Does that make sense? So there is a number that's, you know, there's exceptions to it, but there's a number that, you know, 10 to the minus six is, is pretty style and vacuum. Does everybody see that? For most needs, it would be like going 70 miles an hour or whatever on the highway. It'd be like pretty appropriate, probably the right one. You know, you might be out in some other state and they, they have maybe higher speed limits and you might be in lower speed limits. But, you know, a number like 65, 70 is pretty much good. Is there exceptions to that? Of course. But for us and to get a, a, a qualitative feel for what is vacuum, that's a pretty handy good number. Does everybody see that? So that's what we're looking at here. So just to go back and like basic physics and, and, and read through this briefly, Gases of equal volume and pressure have the same number of molecules. And gases are compressible, which is really important. And gases expand with increased uh, temperature. And that's important in other things like in plasmas, because we start out at room temperature and might go to something like room temperature plus a hot cup of coffee, like 125 degrees Celsius in a, in a core of a plasma. And so then our vacuum chamber and the vacuum conditions are changing and the load is changing, the electrical load. So we need things like impedance matches and such in our vacuum systems, like in an RIE for that reason. So PV equals NRT isn't just dry high school you know, physics. It actually has direct application to how we can actually make a good product because our, our chamber, our vacuum chamber under a plasma state is actually in a nonlinear mode. And we have to have a corrective issue, which would be an impedance match. So gases mix completely. And that's true because they're in Brownian motion, mixing around in there. And then in parentheses, given enough time, does everybody see that? But the, the time thing here is, you know, like micro milliseconds. So we're going to just gloss over that and say that that's a true statement. Although, you know, technically it's, it's not, you know, you have to have that time constraint in there. So we'll just let that go. So total pressure of mixture of gas is the sum of pressure of each. And that's true. Like we're sitting around and in, 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 like in my kitchen, the majority of the, the gas in here is nitrogen. And then the number two, you know, most prominent gas would be oxygen. So they're in, you know, in the level of like 79 20%, something like that, you know, and then the other percent or so is others, you know, kind of stuff like that. And then the one that they don't mention, because it's so variable, you see it on the news, is humidity. So the water, you know, varies tremendously, right? And it varies to where you live. You got an app, you go to, I remember I was in Arizona one time in a training course in, in for some other area, you know, an outdoor event. And I'm like, whoa, I got to drink some more water. It's so ridiculously dry. And the dude's like, it's 19% humidity. It's like crazy. I'm like, where I live, I used to live in Pittsburgh. It was like 80 all the time because we had the three rivers and stuff like that, you know? And I'm like, you're thinking 19% is a lot of humidity. I was just like dry as a bone. So that the environment changes. We want a controlled environment and vacuum provides that. Does that make sense? So the vacuum fills there. Okay, good. Steady state. So this is the theory of pressure. So pressure is actually like a vector thing that we could say is how much gas is impinging on the walls. Does everybody see that? So if I have like not so many gas molecules in my system, then I have not so much uh, 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 pressure, right? And I have very, I have really high vacuum. And the more that I go towards atmosphere, the more impingement that I have. Does that make sense? And one of the things that we're going to look at is the mean free path. And the mean free path is like a statistics thing, right? Mean. So it's an average spacing. The path is the, is the closeness between the average atom molecule in a vacuum system. So I'm just introducing that. It's, it's a rather... I don't know, it's kind of a wild concept. People just don't walk around talking about that kind of stuff, you know? So I don't know. Tonight we're going out. My wife made some real good, she made reservations at a, a nice restaurant pretty far from us. So I, I know if I was over there sitting at a table and talking about mean free path, 
people would be staring at me. They'd be like, what's wrong with you? Just eat your fish sandwich and have a beer. So, you know, it, it's a really odd conversation, but we need to establish that in here. And one of the things that, you know, Nancy and Steve are going to show you this concept of mean free path, the distance, which is again, looking at this, you know, the, the population of gas in a system, the population in the gas, which could be the definition of vacuum is really has a lot to do with the quality of the product. So this is, this is like really a, a, this is a takeaway message in here. That's why I'm introducing it to you. And I'm trying to frame it for you because it's a rather abstract concept. So it's, it's like a population concept. And it also has mapped into it in some ways in your head, a distance. So it's the distance, the average distance, not that it impinges to the wall, but each gas molecule bangs into each other. Does that make sense? So it's a distance thing. And we're going to see why that's, you know, one of the things to learn, you have to have the question in your head. So I just proposed the question, system design, how big does it have to be? And how much vacuum do we need? And the carrot on the end of the stick is a heart valve you're putting into your grandmother. So th these are important concepts and it's not BS. Th this, is, this is real deal. Does everybody see that? So this is why vacuum is important. So the atmospheric pressure around us at sea level or whatever. So I'm not at sea level. I'm actually at 1900 feet or so, I think. You know, I know the mountains around here go a little bit higher, you know, in, in my area. But it, 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 a, a textbook thing is at sea level, the standard pressure is 760 torr. Does that make sense? So let me do a, a really terrible drawing for you that's embarrassing because my parents gave me really poor knees and arthritis. Thanks, mom and dad, but they're the most beautiful people in the world. Blessed to have such good parents. But they gave me bad knees. I'm from Central Europe, so we all have arthritis. And I don't have the ability to draw. And my mother was like an artist. But I'm mechanically inclined like my father. So, so I still got lucky. Lucky draw on the parents for me. But make in front of my... I'm going on, I'm going on Monday to talk to a surgeon to get me a plastic knee that was made in a vacuum system. So I'm into it, you know, I hope he puts it in because I, I just tell him, keep it. I can't walk that much anymore. And I just love being in a forest and I walk in the mountains all the time and I still do, but it's kind of really painful, you know, and I'm, I fall down a lot. I don't want to like break my neck or something. So, but there's worse things in life and I'm still alive. So who cares? But have, having the ability today to get like a plastic knee a replacement, a prosthetic device, and that's some of the things that I teach is prosthetic device manufacturer. That's what I teach in graduate school. So that's really beautiful. You know, my, my parents didn't have that 50 years ago. They didn't have the option to get new knees. My dad had really bad knees when he was older. He, he walked with crutches and stuff. So when we look at atmosphere, we're here at 760 Tor. Let me put the T on there for Mr. Tor in his honor. But if, if we say, what's a Tor? Well, mathematically, a Tor is this. I mean, if we just look at, you know, 760, and usually my mass goes away. Like, so you'll hear me going like, ah, uh, because for some reason, my, my drawing pen just goes nothing. Sometimes it's a, an arrow and sometimes it's a pen. And then sometimes it just disappears. I have no idea. So if I said 700, if I take this number, like the atmosphere, and then I divide it like a pizza into one 760th, I have like one tour. So has everybody got that? So, you know, I have like a, a physics degree, but I'm more of an engineer. So I'd say that number is like a thousand. The physics guys are cringing because they want decimal points. But I'm back of the envelope kind of guy. So I'm like, hey, if I took atmosphere and divide it by about a thousand or about 760, I got me a tour. Does everybody see that? But it works even better. And you could see why. Because actually things like a lot of gauges on machines, they say this. That's a small M. <laughs> 
it says Militor. So I divided this again. Well, not again. Now I divided it by a thousand. Does that make sense? And then really, I like to have machines go to 10, 10 this is 10 to the minus three. So let me write that down. I can't believe my cursor thing st is staying on there. I got to try to make a capital T out of respect for Mr. Tor. And then the one that I'd like to hit is 10 in most of industry, they like to hit 10 to the minus six Tor. And then we have down here, and it doesn't have to be increments of a thousand. It's just, that's my scale today, right? So, but other things like diodes and stuff like that, they could be made at 10 to the minus nine Tor, 10 to the minus 12, way deep. Does everybody see that? But look at the look at the cleanliness. The air that we're in, if we divided that by 760, to me, this is kind of, to me, there goes my thing, that my drawer went away. To me, this area right here, it's kind of like big vacuum to me, a tour. Like when I backfill with gases, like for etching, ooh, that's a lot. For deposition, it's even a lot, kind of, mostly. Depends. But really, all the machines, like your car reads miles per hour, like 10 miles an hour on your speedometer. All the machines read like Militor or minus six. Those are milestones. Does everybody see that? So we're taking atmosphere, dividing it by a thousand. And I'm not that comfortable with that. It's kind of a big number to me. And then I divide it by a thousand again. Now I'm feeling pretty good. But then minus six, I'm like, yeah, really good. Is everybody hip? So minus six is like a legit goal. And I would have to say that that's a happy number for most of the value in my cell phone. Does that make sense? And if I'm looking at lasers and stuff, then that's done in this world. Does, is everybody good? But for the most part, I don't have that many laser kind of things that I own, kind of. You know, I do own some, but not that many. Not compared to the billions, billions of transistors like CMOS that I have in my phone, right? I keep on showing my phone because it's a teaching aid and I'm gonna to try to deduct it on my taxes this year. So there you go. So the atmosphere around us, I said, you know, and this is the textbook. Because again, if I'm next to a bakery and I can smell them making donuts or whatever, then there's gonna be like sugar and all kinds of stuff and vanilla in the air. Does everybody see that? So this is textbook. We're, we're in about 78% nitrogen, about 21% oxygen, and 1% nitrogen, and then others. Does everybody see that? And then the one that we don't see is the water vapor. And that's the one that's like scary because it's hydrogen and oxygen, and it's a real wild card. So I always tell the students, it's like them guys at Halloween that wear the hockey masks underneath your bed that have the big knives like Freddy Krueger, the other dude, I don't even know who they are, but you know, Jason, Jason, Jason and Freddy Krueger kind of stuff. That's what water vapors like. There's some scary entities, you know, they're just, they're, they're like, uh, you know, demons or something like that. Baba Yaga, I guess, from my, from my youth. So the vacuum pressure we, we look at is 760 and then you know, I look at this, there's physicists, they might say there's four vacuum ranges and they're wrong. No, it's, it's just like a rose is a rose. You can call it what you want. But typically most people would say there's three vacuum ranges. And I think that that's really appropriate because it maps physically onto what pumps do and how vacuum hardware is designed. So I think that this list is, is intriguing in some ways, like this structure implies hardware and industry. So it, it takes it from like an academic realm or mathematical construct to 
what the machines actually look like. Does that make sense? So like a high vacuum machine, if you're walking, you know, in a lab and look over, you're like, that's a high vacuum machine. And if I'm in a lab and I walk and I look over and I look at a machine and I see these different fittings on there, I'm like, that's ultra high vacuum. I would know what kind of pump they're running. I could probably guess what kind of material they're making I have to take people on tours and fabs. Because if you kind of look over, you could kind of see what they're doing. You know, if you have enough background, you know, it, it's obvious. That's why they don't want you to bring cameras into fabs because a picture could really be dissected into maybe something that they don't want people to know, right? So here's the vacuum range. We have atmosphere, for, uh, the rough is called rough and it's due to roughing pumps. And that's probably like the simplest vacuum level. And it's moderately easy to obtain with pumps that are moderately inexpensive. And this would be the rough level from atmosphere to 10 to the minus three tour. This would be the thing that we would use a lot primarily to help the high vacuum pumps. So it's like a, like a, like a manual transmission. You start out in first gear and then you shift into second. Usually the high vacuum pumps can't start out, like a car can't start out in second gear. You usually have to be first gear and then shift into second. That's probably the main reason. The other thing we could say about this, to, to fill in the picture, what, what is rough vacuum? Rough vacuum is atmosphere to 10, to 10 to the minus three. That's where we would have the junk industry. So we would make things like fish and lures or like this. Oh, I have it covered up with my cover, but my apple symbol. Do I even have one? I don't know if I have one. Yeah, this apple little chrome thing. That doesn't have to be a 10 to the minus six, really, because it's just an Apple logo. So if you're like, if you're coding like Chevy emblems with some chrome to put on the front of a truck, it doesn't have to be the same quality as a heart valve, right? So that's the junk industry, watch bands, fish and lures, you know, uh, birthday cards, things like that, that might have metallic stuff on there that's not that critical. Does that make sense or disposable? High vacuum would be for most of the stuff that we need and use like in our cell phone. And we would need a roughing pump and then a separate pump that works on different physics to take us to that level. And that level is important because it's gonna make our machine like relatively clean and maybe even crazy clean. But then we have ultra high vacuum, which is gonna be crazy, 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 crazy clean. And we don't need it that much for the components that we're making in the current generation, you know, Samsung phone, ga Galaxy phone or iPhone or whatever. Does everybody see that or iPad? Most of those things are made at the 10 to the minus six stuff. Now what they're gonna need to do in the future for other devices, maybe ultra high vacuum will be the word. But so far in technology, this, this minus six stuff just seems to be sweet for a really long time, you know, a really long time. So the mean free path, and this is the thing that I wanna to get to. This is what I was trying to get to. The mean free path is this number. And the number is like a dynamic number, but then it's quantified into a number that should give you a warm and fuzzy feeling. And it actually maps into this crazy concept of cleanliness that I've been trying to talk about since the first slide. So it's cleanliness. And if I have a long mean free path, it means in a chamber, they bounce around like this, Brownian motion, random motion. When one atom or molecule bounces in, hits another, then it might bounce around in the machine forever. And we could say that that takes like two centimeters, or we could say it takes a kilometer. So if it's two centimeters, the population in there is relatively high that these atoms or molecules bots into each other. And then we say, if we apply another vacuum level, we can say that the, the, the mean free path is like here from my kitchen table to the guy just moved in next door, which is a tragedy or behind me. He put a barn into his horse. 
Well, it's only, that's only 150 yards. <clears throat> so that's about 200 to his barn. That was an Amish field. So I had all this land I didn't have to, I've got four acres, but I wasn't paying taxes on that. But now I got a neighbor, so I don't like that. But he, he's okay. But the mean free path is not like centimeters like this, right? It's like some place that takes you a while to walk to. How big is a chamber? Put your arms around it. I don't know. Big as a washer, dryer, big as a microwave oven, big, big as an oven that you cook, you know, chicken in or something, you know, in your kitchen. So chambers are in and around that. So is a contamination issue. If the gas was so rare that it took from me to that barn to bump into each other, if you had an enclosure as big as an oven in your kitchen, then there's just not that much junk in there. How about it? It's pretty clean. Does everybody see what the mean free path is? So the mean free path varies according to the vacuum level. So if we look at the vacuum level at atmosphere 760, that column, the number of, of molecules per cubic centimeter, like big as a, a sugar, sugar cubes or sugar cubes for having for tea, right? There's three times 10 to the 19. I don't even know what 10 to the 19 is. The number's so big, I can't get my head around it, but it's a lot. But the mean free path, again, really can't get my head around it because it's a millionth of a meter, of a centimeter. Holy heck, it's a millionth of a hundredth. So I don't even know what that is. I mean, they're right next to each other. Does everybody see that? I can't picture it because I can't see stuff like that. You can see down to about 30 microns. 40 microns. So this stuff is minus six centimeters. It's hard for me to even know what that is. But when we go to 10 to the minus three, still the number of molecules in there, 10 to the 13, I don't know what that means. It's too big for me to get my head around. But I'm looking at the mean free path and it's five centimeters. And I'm like, oh, that's two inches. So I know what two inches is. It's like this, right? So every, like your knuckles right here is an inch. So it's two of your knuckles. So two inches. I'm in. Does everybody see that? Two inches. Then I look at minus nine. And I know my chambers are as big as my oven. But the mean free path is 48 kilometers. Does everybody see that? There's like 1.6 miles to a kilometer, right? So holy heck. I don't know what that is. 30 miles or something. That's pretty far. Does everybody see that? Like I'd need a gallon and a half of fuel to do that in my forerunner. That's pretty far. So does everybody see the, the mean free pass stuff? And really what I want you to do is like juggle some balls. Like how big is a machine and how big is like a silicon wafer? And what are the chambers like? Does everybody see that, that kind of concept? So I'm going to ask you, don't you think that 48 kilometers is kind of overkill and something as big as a kitchen oven? 10 to the minus six might be something from me to the horses. That's clean enough. Does everybody see this relative thing? I kind of want you to know it like going 75 miles an hour in a school zone at 3.30 with the lights flashing. So the previous table gives us insight for both system design and contamination issues. As you can see, the mean free path can establish the size of a tool. So we said here, probably two inches is gonna cut it because two inches isn't that good for contamination maybe in something as big as a kitchen oven. And then we're saying like 48 kilometers me, that's, that's really crazy compared to a kitchen oven. So this is like that girl goes in the woods, finds some beds, finds some porridge. The bears come home and say, what are you doing in my house? You know, too hot, too cold, those kind of things. You know, that fable. So which one's right? You know, which one's appropriate? And really for most products, the cleanliness would be on the order of 100 meters or so like that as a mean free path in a chamber as big as a, a meter 
that's probably good. Not that it's not, there's not contamination in there, but relative scale, it's minuscule. Does everybody see that? So, so here, I think this machine, this is a thermal evaporator. So let me get my little arrow thing out or my, it's hard to do. Like, so I'm looking at my chamber and let's just go over here and say, how big is my vacuum chamber? And I'll show you this. Nancy's gonna show you this and Steve. I don't know, a chamber might be something like this, like one meter tall. And that's, that's, that's an exaggeration for most machines. Does that make sense? But now what I'm gonna do with this machine, basically, this is a thermal evaporator. So what does a thermal evaporator do? It takes a solid, you apply heat, it changes it to a vapor, sublimates it. Then that vapor goes up into another solid and it coalesces and it goes down into a solid. So I go from solid, the vapor, the solid. So it's like a, a condensation thing, right? So I have the solid, I create a vapor, and then it's a solid. Does, does everybody see that? It's kind of like a spray paint can in some ways. I, I have to hit the nozzle and then I go like this with spray paint. But I'm not doing paint. I'm doing like a metal. And these are fame, these are most appropriate for lower temperature metals and I'll say low temperature because I'm an engineer I want to know the, 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 the threshold I would say non refractory metals and a refractory metal would need like more oxygen pumped into it with coal or whatever that's where they made the line so that they would get hot enough flame to melt it right so some things have a higher melting temperature so something below like, I don't know, titanium thermal evaporator and, and they're elemental. They, they tend to temperature segregate alloys and that's probably not so swift for most applications. But anyhow, the one we have in here, we're gonna use in our example, we're gonna have my good friend aluminum, A. Oh, there goes, my drawing dude went away. L, he went away again. Ah, uh, little L, aluminum. And aluminum melts at like 663 or something on a periodic table or whatever. But in a vacuum, it melts differently and it melts differently because it's on tungsten and whatever. There's all kinds of things that are going on, but it's going to melt at a moderately lower temperature, you know, of, of, of something like, I don't know, 573 or something, who knows. But, but it's going to melt at some lower temperature. So we heat this filament up and, and you get thermionic emission from metal. Like when you see it glowing red and metal, it's usually about 600 degrees. Does that make sense? 600 degrees C. So we're gonna heat this up red, just like your toaster oven, like you make bagels in a toaster or a hair dryer, which I don't need because I keep my hair short. My beard though, a little bit wooly. But the, the I don't, I'd still just use a towel. I don't need a hair dryer in that. But anyhow, on the, the, the aluminum here, I'm gonna heat it up with something like a toaster oven kind of, you know, boat tungsten, like a filament in an old school light bulb. And I'm gonna heat it up so it boils. And it's gonna give off like aluminum steam, like aluminum vapor, and it's gonna go up to the substrate. So why do we have a shutter on here? Because aluminum always has aluminum oxide on the outside and probably who knows bacteria or viruses or who knows what. It's probably, it's not as pure as the inside. So what we do is we melt it at first, we have a shutter there and the shutter actually captures all the junk that first comes off. Does that make sense? And then we remove the shutter and then we're spraying up pure aluminum and we, we're on the substrate and we're gonna say my substrate is a piece of glass and I'm making a mirror. So if I don't have this high vacuum pump, if I only have the roughing pump, and I don't turn on I don't turn on the high vac. I'm going to pump it ten to the minus three. Tor, better put that on there. Somebody will take points off on my test. I'll put the T on there. So anyhow, my mean free path is two inches. My machine's a mirror, so my aluminum's going up like this. 
aluminum, aluminum, and it runs into some junk right here. Then aluminum goes up, runs into some junk up here. So I have the shutter removed. Aluminum lands on my substrate like this, and I'm at 10 to the minus three. And now this is the new aluminum that I put on there. I should do this. Let me format, I'll make aluminum, make aluminum green today. My aluminum's like this. So I put this aluminum coating onto my mirror. It's not harder than it looks. It's just that I have no talent and the machine's not so good, but it's more I don't have a talent to draw. So anyhow, here's my aluminum on there and I made a mirror, but it's a crappy mirror because what do I have in my mirror at 10 to the minus three? Somebody want to give me an answer? It's supposed to be a L203, right? I mean, AL, AL, but AL203 is aluminum oxide. It's sandpaper. We wanted to have a metal, which is reflective, malleable. You put photons on, it has too many electrons already because we can model metals an infinite sea of electrons and it reflects, it reflects light. And that's what we want in a mirror. But if we have a mean free path of two inches and we're 10 to the minus three, we have the John Wick water vapor in there. And what it does is, why it's the scary boogeyman, it's gonna make my mirror not mirror-like, it's gonna make it crappy-like because my, my aluminum is gonna be dull and I'm gonna make a really bad mirror. And that would be bad if I'm making like sunglasses. Does everybody see that? Like mirrored sunglasses, you know, Oakley sunglasses or something. They, they need to be like pure. Or I could be have this mirror for like, you know, a mirror in my, it was the Subaru, not in my truck. My truck is different now. But when I put it in reverse, I could see my backup camera. So that's a high tech mirror. So we want to like use care. So I can't have a mean free path of 10 to the minus three because my aluminum runs into different background gas, dog dandruff, vanilla smell, who knows what is going to be in there at 10 to the minus three. And every two inches, it runs into some kind of contaminant. So when it gets up to my mirror, it's dirty. But now what do I do this? Now I do the case and let me do my draw and try to draw again for you. What if I do 10 to the minus six tour? I'd say from our charts, and it wasn't on a chart, but I'd say my main free path is a football field. Whether you're American, American football or Europe and you're saying soccer, right? So it's a football field. My aluminum is gonna be relatively clean from this point to land it on my mirror. And I'm gonna make a really good mirror and it's gonna be a metal, not a metal that grab oxygen and hydrogen and dog dandruff and vanilla odor and smoked salmon and cream cheese. So th that's what main free path is. And why do we need a deep vacuum? And what we do is we pump with this mechanical pump and due to its physics, it only goes to 10 to the minus three because it backstream that the, the gas can make it through the oil that's on the wall. So there's a piston and a piston wall. And they don't touch or there'd be much friction. So the seal's made with oil, but that oil will break down and the gas will be able to permeate that in and around 10 to the minus three, no matter what the oil is. There's different oils and it varies a little bit. But around, they give up, that's about as much as they can go, 10 to the minus three. And that's not as much, that's not enough for a heart valve. We went minus six. And if it was a military thing or space mission, you know, uh, uh, aerospace parts, we'd probably still, we would be doing it at like minus nine or something because we would make sure that it's super pure, right? So the vacuum level, and that mean free pass statistical model 
has a lot to do with the quality of the product. So a mechanical pump just isn't going to buy it. Now it's not drawing my. So what I do is I pump the 10 to the minus three. I close these valves, open this valve, turn on this pump, which is like a jet engine. And that's a helper pump to this mechanical pump. Now the mechanical pump is going to be on the exhaust of the turbo pump, which is like an airline jet pump. And it, it's that it's on the exhaust because we really can't go 10 to the minus six to atmosphere. That threshold of energy differential is too much. So we take it in two stages. We take it from high vacuum to rough to atmosphere. And our mechanical pump then becomes my four line pump and it acts in a different method. Does that make sense? It, it's like, you know, Verbs become an adverbs or not, you know, so it's, it's like a change. It operates differently. It's still the same pump, but before we rough the system, Don, and now what we're doing is helping where it's like a helper pump to the high vacuum pump. Does that make sense? There's any numbers of really like mechanical pumps. There's different types and there's even dry pumps that don't have oil in them, but they're real expensive and need a lot of maintenance and they have their own series of problems, vibration and stuff. So, you know, but they're the ones that you're, they're the ones that you use to make the parts in your cell phone, not the oil roughing pumps. They're kind of old school, but there's turbo pumps. There's diffusion pumps. There's all kind of high vacuum pumps, but this is just one simple way of doing it. Does that make sense? And, and, and this is what I wanted to do today. My goal was, I wanted to map on, I wanted you guys to have, which a lot of books don't convey well. What is vacuum? You could read it and you could do the math and I could put up the equations for you, right? And I want to, because it took me till I was 40 years old to pay off those student loans. So I wanted to present th this, does everybody see that? So I wanted you to know what a tour was. Just like a carpenter knows how long it would take to build a dog house or what's it like to be going 50 miles an hour in a car. Where does that map to? A safety zone, a highway, a side route in the country? You know, what does it mean to go 10 miles an hour in a car? It means you're like, I got to get out of here. You know, that, that, that's too slow. Does everybody see that? This is a system design. If we look at the film, like a, a two dimensional film for deposition, if we look at atmosphere, it's going to have all kinds of stuff in it. And, and, and we have to question on the nano scale if that's appropriate. If we were doing things like making a sheet of steel or aluminum foil, it's not that important because of the scale. But when we're looking at nanotechnology, that wouldn't work. It would certainly not be as pure as we'd want it to be. If we're at 10 to the minus three, our material is going to be it's going to be high tech and cool, like my little Apple symbol on my phone or the Toyota plastic, you know, on the front of my Forerunner that's silver, but it's made out of plastic because it's lighter and it's efficient, but they wanted the silver to, to look better. But, you know, that's good enough for that. You know, the, the thing that says Forerunner on, on my car, truck, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, when we look at 10 to the minus nine, boy, that's mean free path is like, here to the next town away. That's probably overkill. But for things like diodes or something, that's probably what we need or military space missions. But really the sweet spot in between there is probably minus six. And that maps to the pipes. So there's certain connections like QF, KF fittings and those things and that's how everybody runs, you know? So those things real and how the roughing pump works, it's the intersection of these other things, you know, and some other like domain, like the, like the mechanical pump domain, the hardware domain, like what would, you know, silicon or chemres, calres, o-ring domain, what would they mean? You know, and, 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 and the sweet spot there is like 10 to the minus six, minus seven. And that's good enough. 
Does everybody see that? So this is the main free path. So the main free path sets the size of the tool. And, you know, if we would have something like my window here and I'm spraying out that cone, the machine has to be as big as like a big ballroom. Does everybody see that? And they have machines like that. And they have pumps as big as a Volkswagen, like diffusion pumps. And they run these through these big machines that coat things like glass. Or I know at Penn State, I worked on helicopter rotors. So there's big things like jet windshields. Like how do you keep them from pitting? You know, because they're always hitting dirt. How do they just not like sandblast away? You know, they're going 500 miles an hour and they're just hitting dirt. So you need to have coatings on there so that they don't, diamond-like coatings probably, that they don't wear away. Does everybody see that? So those things, you know, on a bigger scale, you need bigger machines and you'll need a bigger mean free path. And then the pumps themselves look differently, you know, a little bit. So I, I, don't, not, I don't have time to do this, but I want to show you the notes. So there's different vacuum pumps and you just don't pick one. They're like golf clubs. You pick the right one for the right job, right? So there's different pumps and there's a number of pumps. These are like I guess, you know, from my perspective, they're the typical physics of most pumps. And when we discuss the physics of those pumps, the students get a greater understanding of science. You know, so I, I'm not here just to teach vacuum, but to teach physics like EE 101, Chem 101, Bio 101, again and again until they understand it, just like understand what vacuum means. So we talk about like actually how does a thermocouple work? Actually, how does the turbo pump work? Actually, how does a capacitive manometer work? And how it's physical, how, how you would describe the physics, how does it fail? Or what's its boundary values? You know, what does it measure well or not measure well? Or what vacuum can we achieve with that? And what are the trade offs, right? So in engineering, you always have, and I heard this, this is one of the truer statements that I ever heard when I was a puppy, when I was a puppy engineer. An engineer, my, my, my mentor, walked up to me serious like serious as a heart attack day he's like i want you to tell me now what an engineer is and i'm like i'm drinking my coffee what are you talking about he's it's a value decision maker he's you have a set of columns of advantages and disadvantages most people get them confused and we could rule the world because we know the truth and i'm like check it out i'll finish my coffee now that's pretty good so we say things like airbags go off one in a zillion times and they they're bad but for the most part, they save a lot of lives. And somebody has to say that. Or the, a 10 to the minus six is good enough. Because these cell phones are ridiculously expensive anyhow. You know? So I like that. That was a good comment. So these are the mechanical pumps. And I talk about that, how they work advantages and disadvantages. And I always, you know, this is one of the first things I teach in a course. And I'm like, this is what we do. We look at like aluminum and they're like, what's aluminum good for? What's it bad for? We look at silicon, what's it advantage, disadvantage? We look at polymers, what are they good for? What are they bad for? We look at, you know, a gasket. We look at chemres or calres. We look at, you know, these things, what are they good for and bad for? And you have to know all the dimensionality, right? And then I go over, this is a standard system, high vacuum pumps. And then, the thing I wanted to show is these systems match to not just the thermal evaporator, but they're the foundation of a lot of different tools. So, you know, we looked at this one in detail, well, for five minutes, but we can see that vacuum purveys a lot of the standard machinery and nanotechnology semiconductor market. Here's a reactive ion etch plasma etching. And certainly without plasma etching, you don't have a phone period because you can't use wet because of surface tension and all that other stuff. And you have to get anisotropic profiles and all that other stuff. I'm actually a plasma etch guy. That's my background. So I'm all into that. Right. But look, the machine's kind of like the same, the core, just take 10 steps back. Look at a thermal evaporator, reactive ion etch, PECVD. The commonality is vacuum, 
hardware gas. Well, well, you'd select the hardware and gasket so that they don't fatigue, right? Does that make sense? So that's why there's more than one gasket because you want to like look at your ambient, whatever you're pumping in or whatever, your gas and say, whoa, that don't really go that well with copper, even though it's softer and better. We might want to go to nickel or something, right? So, you know, we look at things like that. And sputtering tool, they're really, it's neat because you can use the same power supplies, you can use the same hardware, you can inventory less product, right? So this commonality stuff is a blessing. Uh, so uh, uh, somebody asked, uh, does the four line between the turbo pump and the mechanical rough pump have to be heated? Generally, it depends. Well, it's a, it's a difficult question because it depends on the chemistry. When you're running material through there and they have a chance of coalescing, the answer is you heat the surface so that it doesn't coalesce on there so that it wouldn't build up. And then you take it to the scrubber and that's where it gets alleviated. So it, it's really dependent on the chemistry. Although I'll add this, a lot of times what people do and in systems like that in the four line section or post four line section, or even in the turbo pump, in the turbo pump at the back end of the turbo pump, they'll feed in like nitrogen hmm. as a dilutant so that our ambient that leaves the chamber that wasn't used up in the process isn't so wicked. Okay. So the solution, the pollution is dilution. And that's what we would do on the turbo. So there's a couple things we can do. We can run heater, even do that on a chamber. The chamber walls, actually, they put on something that looks like a moss pad, usually like burnt orange color. And they'll heat the chamber up so that we don't get condensation in there, that everything can go to the scrubber. So I know like in different fabs or you got students, they lean on stuff and they're like, whoa, that's hot. And you're like, well, why do you think it's hot? And the answer is that condensation. So that's a good question. So there's a couple, you know, to, to expand on that. That's why you would have like nitrogen bleed gas in a pump. And, and it's, it's dependent on the ambient to answer your question. Thank you. Any other questions before I turn it over to Kathy and Steve? So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Kathy. And what she's going to do is show you the mean free path in, in her, her lab. Does that sound good? So um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Nancy Luaji, and I'm here with um, our lab assistant, Steve O'Sell. Uh, we're at Normandale Community College in um, Bloomington, Minnesota. We have a vacuum and thin film technology program that we offer here. And uh, it's a two-year program, and it's intended for individuals who are going to work as technicians at some of the manufacturing uh, locations and, um, uh, re and, and even research university here uh, in our region. So I guess my first question is, how many of you have already worked with vacuum systems, do a lot of um, different activities with vacuum systems? Uh, just kind of curious what the background is. If you just do a thumbs up, then I can get a sense for that. Okay, I think um, I just got a one thumbs up. So, uh, so the, I guess the kind of the, the motivation for our program, like I said, is technician education. But um, we also find that uh, there's a lot of individuals who are doing the science and engineering and research um, that uh, benefit from doing, uh, you know, getting some basic background in vacuum technology like we offer so um, so I'm glad that <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that uh, we can kind of give you um, a ground level introduction to some of this uh, technology so one one other piece I'll add uh, regarding our program is we we, we received a National Science Foundation um, Advanced Technological Education grant award um, seven years ago now to work on making our program uh, uh, a, a distance education compatible uh, program. So we're coming to you from a room that's outfitted with um, a nice uh, video camera audio system and, uh, and the technology to actually 
interface with the video conferencing platform like Zoom. So uh, again, based on that, I saw just one person uh, has done more extensive work with vacuum system. I'll do just a quick uh, tour around our room for you. So you see the different vacuum systems we use as part of our, our program. I think there was two, um, Nancy. I, I think uh, Kalumari and, and I raised our, our hands and, and so we had some uh, vacuum uh, history. Thank you, Greg. I, I just saw the one come up and I scrolled and didn't, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm sitting now at what we call our instructor station. And this is what allows, or this is the uh, position that we use for uh, doing the bulk of the teaching work in here because it gives us access to um, a desktop system where you know we do kind of the things with the uh, PowerPoint and we can interface with a um, a desktop uh, uh, camera like this, but probably the key thing to this telepresence room is this um, uh, video control um, unit that we have here. So we can use this to zoom and um, move around and look at different things um, really easily. So uh, I'm going to try to do this as efficiently as possible. So here in the back of the room, I'm showing you um, a couple of different vacuum systems we use as part of our first introductory course. This is a this is a simple rough vacuum system. They're, they they both are um, using the same uh, rough vacuum pump. It's a little uh, diaphragm pump, and it allows us to achieve a base pressure of um, close to two torr. So that's the lowest those um, systems are going to generate. But it's a, a nice um, system for us to do kind of the introdu introductory concepts with the, the technology. Our second class is based on using um, this, this system with the yellow chamber is what we call our high vacuum system. So it's paired now um, a rough pump using a scroll pump with a uh, molecular drag pump. So the, the rough pump gets us down just a little bit below, well, like a half a tor. And then the turbo molecular pump, or the molecular drag pump, excuse me, uh, will allow us to get down to a base pressure, um, something around 1 times 10 to the minus 5 when we're working with this um, polymer type of uh, 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 plexiglass kind of chamber. And then a decade uh, a lower if we've got a, um, a metal chamber. So that's the that's the working system we use in our second class. That's called our second class is vacuum analysis and troubleshooting. And then in our final or capstone course in our program, we work with this system and a couple of other ones. The one that we'll demonstrate for you shortly. Uh, this is a sputtering tool that uh, Terry uh, talked about briefly. Um, this one has two different uh, power sources on it, so we can use it to um, deposit um, both insulating materials and conductive materials. And that we use in our uh, final course called thin film deposition. And in that course, they do a variety of different deposition activities. And then they use different characterization uh, tools to look at the quality of the deposited material. Then one other system I'll show you just um, each, each one of these systems is uh, kind of got a different uh, design with the combination of pumps on it. Um, one, one of our best performing systems is this one in the back. And this one has um, on it, on, the, on your far right, you see kind of a knob that's hanging off of it. And that's the cryo pump. Yep, thank you, Steve. And so with this particular system, we're able to achieve a base pressure um, we think 
we, we just had it running this week for demonstration as part of a class and it got down to one times 10 to the minus seven tor. And if you let it pump a while, it probably can get uh, down another decade. So that one can probably achieve the one times 10 to the minus eight tor. And this is a really interesting point to demonstrate to students is that that the, the, tr the trick to getting as low as you can with some of these systems is as much about all of the components you choose to use with them and how it's designed. Because you'll notice, or it, you might not notice, but this system happens to be our largest volume system. And yet it's the one, because of the way it's designed, is uh, capable of achieving the lowest base pressure. So that just gives you um, a bit of a flavor of the different systems that we demonstrate for students in this class or in this classroom space. Um, and we're going to do we're going to do a demonstration for you of the uh, the thermal evaporation um, that Terry talked um, pretty extensively about during this session. Um, the system we have that we're going to use is the one right in front of us and or it, it's right in right in the middle of your screen i'm going to zoom in as we start the um, deposition process um, but first i was going to share um, just a, a brief uh, powerpoint that i had put together to go with uh, terry's mean free path um, presentation so as he talked about, mean free path is kind of the critical element that we're, we're considering when we design any process because we're trying to control um, what the density of the number of molecules and types of molecules are in the space in which we're trying to carry out a process. And this mean free path, again, is the average um, distance that a molecule is, is moving before it collides with another molecule. That's, sorry, I'm, okay. So uh, I'm showing you one really simple formula that we use with our students to do an estimation of what you can expect mean free path will be for a given background pressure. So you know kind of what you're talking about you have for the mean free path. Now, this, this approximation is based on an assumption that the, the, the surrounding environmental temperature is about 20 degrees C. It's, that's not a bad assumption to make in a lot of industrial manufacturing environments because that's what they try to control their room environment to is something about you know like a room temperature. Um, if you are under other temperature conditions, this formula would not hold. So this is an important consideration is this is just an estimation and it only it only pertains at this particular temperature, but it's not a bad one to use for a lot of situations. So um, again, the problem with the short mean free path is that it, um, op it, it what we're trying to do is move some desired material from a bulk source and coat it essentially a molecule at a time to build up a very thin layer on some other on some other surface which we call a substrate and under room or the atmospheric conditions these molecules if we were to try to conduct it under these conditions are going to um, bounce off other molecules and have a hard time going from the bulk material to the surface you want to coat. Oopsie. So um, what I'm showing here is that uh, that the from the we're, we're going to demonstrate with aluminum that the aluminum you know makes its way and hits off of a bunch of other things, but it might run into something like oxygen and, and react with it. And then instead of coming to the other, to the surface you want to coat as pure aluminum, it's now something else, aluminum oxide. And that may, may not be the kind of material you want coating your substrate. 
So again, the disadvantage of a short mean free path is that there's um, the opportunity the particles are gonna interact and change species. And the long mean free path means that you'll be able to get what you, the material you want to the surface um, in the condition that you want it. So um, this, the, the term, uh, the, the lambda is often used to represent mean free path. So what we wanna design is a, a system where that mean free path is, is well in excess of the dimensions of the um, system in, in which you're trying to uh, conduct the, uh, the material deposition. So I'll just show these quickly, but um, that if you're, I'm sorry, I, so if, if you're operating at atmospheric pressure, um, you can expect that that mean free path based on that rule of thumb um, equation that I showed is roughly um, point, point 0.07 or 0.1 micrometers. So it, that's a very short distance that molecules are going to be moving before they make, have a collision with another molecule. On the other, on the other hand, when you're at a lower pressure, and I just I did this quickly. This is something for um, an estimation at the edge of atmosphere where your pressure is reduced to about half a millitor. You can expect that your mean free path has increased to something around 10 centimeters. Again, assuming, which is not a great assumption here, but um, a background temperature of 20 degrees. Uh, 20 degrees uh, centigrade. So just a, giving you a sense of how much you change this mean free path um, based on you know, how, how, much, how many molecules are occupying a space uh, that you're working in. Again, I'm, I apologize, this is kind of, uh, I'm, it's kind of clumsy right here now, but are there any questions that I could answer at this point before we go into showing the, um, the evaporation system? Yeah, this is Greg. I, I'm just really interested to see how you demonstrate um, the, the chamber at LCCC. We have a little PVD tool with a turbo molecular pump and a roughing pump, and we, we do some basic demos, but I, I definitely am interested in and how uh, how you show, showcase that uh, remotely, but you know, uh, walking through that, it's going to be really helpful. Okay, yeah, um, great. Uh, so, can you just tell me a little bit about what you uh, what do you demonstrate with your system? Do you do a deposition? Yeah, we do uh, just a copper deposition, no no barrier film, no uh, adhesion promotion. It's just a copper film. Uh, we can use various coins, but we can also use uh, slides. And the glass slides will allow us to do uh, uh, basically an etch process and allow to see them have a deposition and talk about uniformity associated with that. That's awesome. Okay, that's that's great background to, to hear. Thanks for sharing, Greg. Thank you. Okay, I am gonna I am gonna turn the kind of the presentation part now over to Steve. I will. I'll just. I'll set it up by saying we've already pumped the system down and we we've loaded it with a just a plain glass slide that we're going to do the deposition on. Terry, now would be probably a good time to um, share your uh, drawing of the evaporation system you had up a while ago. Thank you. And then I'm going to operate the camera so we can go tight in and you can see some of the components on here on the system we have here better. You good? Okay, this is our basic the uh, evaporation system and uh, right now we have a uh, roughing pump, which is the scroll pump down here. That roughs it out and then on High vacuum part, we have a turbo molecular pump here, and this is the uh, controller for that pump. So, what I've already got it pumped down through uh, the roughing range, and we're already on the high back, and we're reading like 1.7 to the minus five. So, what we intend on doing is we're going to heat up a filament. 
if you can see this. So that's the whoops. That's what we're going to heat up. And we're going to put a uh, little clip of copper on that filament, and we're going to run current through it with this very act right here. So this just varies the uh, current through that uh, filament. And it comes in, I don't know if you want to back up. And it comes in through here on these two electrodes. Sorry. And this uh, filament is inside the vacuum system. So our object here is to coat glass slide. This, this, is, this is just a microscope slide. We're going to coat that with aluminum. And we have two uh, gauges up here. We have a uh, capacitance manometer and a Pirani in, in one package and we have a bare output or an ion gauge for a high vacuum. I'm zooming in so that, uh, that we know that the uh... The busy B is a little hard to read the gauge, yeah. um, but it's it looks like well it, it's one it's at one times ten to the minus five, so I think we might even be below the range of the busy B. Yeah, so we're trying to get within a target pressure of uh, one times ten to the minus four or better. So we're like a magnitude more than that. So uh, we're all set up to do an evaporation here. Let me turn off our iron gauge just for safety here. So and I'll go and zoom. zoom the, we're uh, going to zoom in on the chamber because yep. when it heats up, you can kind of see what's going on in there. So what's going to happen is we're going to run current through that filament, and after a few seconds here, you're going to see that filament heat up. When it heats up, you'll be able to see it through that uh, viewport. You can tell the viewport's been kind of, um, it's not pristine anymore. It's uh, the one problem with evaporation is it goes everywhere in 360. So you don't have a lot of control. So that means it covers up our viewport here. So you have to clean that. So I'm going to start to uh, apply current through this. Let's make sure I got everything going here. Got that off. Okay, so I'm going to increase the current here. That's it. Hopefully, let me valve off my high vacuum pump. So our high vacuum pumps isolated. We can go ahead and bleed up. I'm gonna shut this off. So now I'm I'm actually reading this gauge up here. If you wanna... see that. So now we have a nice coat of aluminum on there. So it was uh, was like this. Now it's coated. 
So we got some other ones here we've done. You can tell we put a, uh, we usually put a piece of tape on there so we can peel it off. So we can actually measure the thickness of it. And then we can characterize it. So we can measure the resistance and the uh, thickness. Greg, did you want Nancy to answer that question that you sent to me? Yeah, it's a little specific. I, I don't have as many meters on the chambers I have. And when you do the evaporation, there's this partial pressure. Do you actually see an increase in pressure on, on the meters that you have within the chamber? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Steve, have we paid attention to see, you know, like when we start the evaporation, if the the pressure, so Greg, you're, you're saying, you know, what kind of a bump up you get in the yeah, pressure? Yeah. Uh, I'm usually busy watching the filament. Yeah. Right okay, understood. I'm just good. I, yeah, I just was curious if that was something you might measure. I, I appreciate on, it. Thank you. Yeah, it depends on the gauge. Sometimes you want to turn those gauges off so they don't draw in or get coated with that material or valve them off so they don't get plated. Yeah. Excellent. You know, it depends where they reside in the machine and what technology, you know, if it's an evaporator, sputtering tool or, or whatever. But usually on an evaporator, you're using like an iron gauge type thing. And we usually valve those off so they don't get funky, you know, covered Excellent. with the other metal because they're supposed to be ionized in the residual gas in the chamber. And if they're actually melting residual metal off of the electrodes, then, then your gauge is not telling the truth anymore. So it's a good <laughs> idea for those kind of gauges to close a valve on it so they don't get corrupted by any evaporant. That's, Excellent. That's what, uh, or that's what Steve did with the ion gauge that's on this system. Um, we could have looked at, since we were not, I think we weren't the, low, the lowest level of measurement on this. Um, the other gauge we have is, uh, is a combination capacitance manometer Pirani. And I don't think we were below pressure, the, the lower limit of the Pirani, we could have looked at that to see what was going on. I was just curious. Yeah, it, it's something I, I was, uh, it was a, if a, a excellent setup. It's a really informative. Thank you. And, and it was really good to see the video uh, of, of the glowing uh, filament as well. It's excellent. Thank you. Um, and I hate to give you a spoiler alert, but I do know that next week's presentation is also going to uh, demonstrate a, a, a different evaporative system. And actually, uh, the one that will be demonstrated, I think, is intended, they, they give the um, parts list. It's a, a lesser expensive kind of setup apparatus for doing evaporation. So uh, you'll, you'll get to see another system uh, do this same kind of process. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, and I, yeah, I think there was talk on that system, and I don't know if this is true. So maybe, you know, you can't hold anybody to it. But they were trying to get NSF funds so that they could uh, distribute those systems for educational uses. So I don't know if they're. I mean, they're, I think they're working on that. You know, if a school needed a simple evaporator and they didn't have money for that capital piece of equipment. Then, then they would they would provide that. So I thought that was a I thought that was a nice, neat mission that they're trying to accomplish. Yep. But whether they can do it or not, I don't know. Understood. Understood. Thank you. So thank you everybody for coming. Um,